I want to start uh, in, in a very appropriate uh, uh, kind of happenstance. We have one of the great um, visionaries of, of making, these, these, uh, making an idea uh, visible to people. Rick Smolin is going to start up our conference. Rick is the uh, innovator, the, the um, kind of visionary behind the Day in the Life photography series. Um, these are those books that uh, they, they have, the, the book is actually only part of it, right? The book is only the end result. It's this amazing project that they cook up where they send thousands of photographers out around the world uh, to go pursue a project, uh, to chronicle something, whether it be the United States or, or Australia or an idea like cyberspace or they've, they've done a medicine book. Uh, they're now uh, engaged in a new idea. It's called the, the Human Face of Big Data. And it's a uh, project that is going to uh, come out in book form on November 20th. But the, the book form is, again, just the tip of what is so amazing about this project. So please uh, join me in welcoming to our stage to kick off the Wired Living by Numbers Conference, Rick Smolin. <laughs> Thomas, thank you so much for that introduction. Thomas actually uh, gave one of the best talks uh, that I've seen in recent years. He's very modest, but at, at TED Med several years ago, he showed us how this, the, you know, you go and your doctor sends you for a blood test and you get this totally indecipherable piece of paper back that none of us can even come close to understanding. And he showed us how just by visualizing it and being able to show you the last time you did a blood test and what, just basically giving you um, a way of taking information that doesn't mean anything to you and putting sort of a human face on it, it's really, uh, it, it sort of changes the way that you relate to information. So um, as Thomas said, I think I have the best job in the world. Every year uh, I get to invite my heroes and uh, my peers and some young journalists and we send them out around the world to learn about a new topic. So about a year ago, um, I was uh, at All Things Digital and I was at TED Med and I was at TED and I'm, all my friends in the technology world, every sort of third uh, word that I heard in their conversation was this word big data. And I said, you know, what's big data? And it was very interesting because everybody I, I spoke to was like the Rorschach test. Everybody had a completely different definition of what it was. The first person I spoke to said, big data is so much information it doesn't fit in your laptop. And it's like, okay, it's not very interesting. <laughs> and then the next person I asked said, no, no, big data is taking information from one organization and then taking information from another and overlapping them and seeing these patterns in the data. And again, okay, I'm a photographer, so that didn't mean much to me. And then I ran to Marissa uh, Meyer, at, uh, who was in a, at uh, Google, and she said, Rick, big data is like watching the planet develop a nervous system. I said, wait, wait, say that again. And she said, right now, all of us with our smartphones, all this data is being gathered in, in through, through, through so many different means. It's like watching the planet wake up. We're starting to be able to, to measure things, analyze them, visualize them, and respond in real time. We've never had that ability before as a, as a species. I thought, that's really cool. And she even sat down and gave me like five assignments. I said, well, how do I take pictures of that? Is it people standing in front of you know, uh, servers? So I want to take you for a second on the journey that I've been uh, through the last year. We've had about 200 people working on this project. It's coming out soon. And as uh, Thomas said, it's many different things. Um, so let's see, I'm going to look at this monitor here. Okay. So I'm going to go to my next slide. So um, uh, Marissa actually pointed me to a really interesting quote that sort of put this in perspective. Because whenever you talk to people in the big data space, you hear these, you know, these numbers, which mean absolutely nothing to me. So she pointed me to this really interesting quote by Eric Schmidt, which is that all the information generated by the human race from the dawn of humanity to 2003, I don't know how Eric figured this out, but is uh, five exabytes, whatever that means. And then now, basically, every uh, two days, we're generating five exabytes. So even if you don't know what an exabyte is, you get a pretty good mental picture. This is a straight vertical line. Then I saw another interesting quote, which also helped me get a sense of perspective, which is that we're starting, basically, to measure everything. Everything that can be measured is being measured, and the cost of measuring is plummeting to almost zero. All of us walking around with our smartphones now are emitting this whole stream of data behind us, which gets more and more valuable as all of us are now starting to create this data. I'm told that when I push this button, there's a delay, so I'm sorry. And then finally, um, all these devices now, uh, my friend Esther Dyson was telling me that um, devices are now generating more information than we are, and the devices are now starting to change their behavior based on each other's 
behavior. So we're not the center of the data solar system anymore, which is actually also very interesting. Now, until about six months ago, whenever I saw this story covered by the media, and I'm a journalist, so I'm part of the media, or at least I used to be, um, I always saw the word big data immediately uh, followed by big brother. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, you know it, it's, it's, it, there is certainly, every time there's a new tool, there's something, you know, that, that scares people about it. It reminds me of the early days of the internet, where uh, I remember, it, and, and we used to call it cyberspace back then, and uh, people were saying, well, isn't it just like email with photographs, or isn't it just a better way to deliver pornography? And yes, it's probably very good at that, but it, uh, it turns out to be very good at, to do other things as well. So I think at the beginning of this journey, I was kind of a little bit skeptical about this big data thing that I was hearing everywhere, and now I'm sort of a, a convert after the, the, the last year. I'm going to keep pushing my buttons here. So. Um, my son, Jesse, is 10 years old, and uh, he keeps walking into the kitchen at like 2 in the morning for a glass of water because I'm always working around the clock on this project. And <clears throat> about a month ago, he came in and said, Dad, every time I hear you on the phone, you're saying big data this and big data that. So what's big data? I'm going, oh, God, how do you tell? How do you explain this to a 10-year-old? So I said, um, okay, Jesse, imagine if your whole life you've been looking through one eye, and all of a sudden, for the very first time, scientists enabled you to open up a second eye. So what you're getting is not just more data, but it's actually it's, it's a different dimension of data. And it was like one of those analogies. He said, well, Dad, is that what computers do? It opens up a second eye? I said, yeah. And he said, could, could you open up a third eye and a fourth and a fifth, like a thousand eyes? And I said, well, that's exactly what's happening. We we're able to grab information now from all these different uh, sources and overlap them and find these actually really interesting patterns. So again, the challenge for us as we were doing this is how do you photograph this? How do you, how do you actually you know, make it something that you and I would care about? How does it affect our parents or our kids or how is it going to affect our lives? If you go back one slide, I'm sorry, now I'm pushing the button too fast. So um, this is an interesting photograph. On the, on the left side you see Times Square at 9 o'clock at night and the right side you see Times Square at 9 o'clock in the morning. And the, this is a wonderful photographer named Stephen Wilkes who does these sort of really interesting sort of montages. The point of the picture is that today we are exposed in the course of a single day to as much information as somebody from the 15th century was exposed to in their entire life. Again, straight vertical line. I'm going to go to the next picture. And also now in the first day of a baby's life, the human race generates 70 times the amount of information in the Library of Congress, which is pretty fascinating. There's also this idea that now, basically, if any of you are planning to run for president or any other political office, <laughs> basically nothing that you do is not being recorded for posterity. So um, this stuff doesn't disappear anymore. And obviously the effect of uh, you know, this data transparency amplified by Twitter and Facebook is having a dramatic impact on the world uh, of politics. I'm going to give you a couple of specific examples of things we learned along the way. So last year when that terrible earthquake hit Japan, obviously very devastating, something that very few people heard about is that 43 seconds before the earthquake hit, before it hit, every bullet train, every factory in Japan stopped. They have spent half a billion dollars installing an early earthquake warning system, and it worked very effectively. Imagine if you've been on a bullet train when the earthquake was hitting. And then we found a very interesting story is that a group of entrepreneurs in Palo Alto realize that the accelerometer that's built into all of our laptops that senses when your laptop's on the way to the floor when, it, when your kid knocked it off the table and it pulls the little head off the platter, that same accelerometer can be used to actually look for earthquakes. So there's a free, crowdsourced, ubiquitous, global earthquake early warning system now in place that costs basically nothing. And what's delightful about it is it's people helping other people just because they can. Um, Joe Ito at the, uh, at the Media Lab um, it, it, it created a um, radiation detector. A lot of people in Japan were very concerned to find out whether the maps that the Japanese government were giving out were accurate. It turns out that the, the maps were as accurate as they could make them because apparently they had 1,000 monitors on 10-meter uh, uh, poles. Well, people all over Japan took it in, into their own hands to actually measure uh, the radiation spread and the map that they came up with was actually very different than the one that was the official map. Sorry, I'm pushing this button as hard as I can. If we could jump to the next slide. Um, in the South Pacific, a group of Australians are putting uh, sensors on animals and using the animals to actually map uh, migration patterns and ocean currents. They put 60, 60 of these transponders all over, all over the Pacific. Whenever the animals get close enough, the, uh, the data in the little heads of the uh, elephant seals here gets dumped into these transponders up to the surface and up to satellites. My kids love this, just the idea of using animals to actually map the planets. 
This is an interesting story. Imagine getting your American Express bill tomorrow, your visa bill, and there's no itemization. I mean, none of us would ever pay a bill like that, right? Well, but we get an electrical bill every month and we play it blindly because we have no way of knowing what our devices are using. Sweet Talk Patel is 27 years old. He's a MacArthur fellow. And uh, he actually invented a little device that recognizes the digital signature of every device in your house. So he can actually tell you what your electric, uh, you know, uh, what your hair dryer uses up or your MacBook Air adapter or your dishwasher. And um, what's fascinating about it, as I said, is there's something that you learned that, that the average person wouldn't know. I mean, that's interesting to get the data, but we still have to pay our bills. He said the average American spends 11% of their monthly bill on their DVR. So that little box that spins under your TV set that we don't pay any attention to at all. So instead of a new oil well or a nuclear power plant, plant we could just redesign the DVR. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster here because I know we don't have a whole lot of time. There's a, a, a woman named Laura Kurgan here in New York City who looked at the crime data of New York and basically instead of looking at where the crimes are committed, she looked at where criminals live before they went to jail. And she said maybe this would be a good place. This is where the government, uh, the city of, of New York spends a million dollars a year on some of these blocks in the picture here. The idea is that if you know that putting people in jail for 20 years doesn't seem to solve the problem, maybe going to where the criminals are coming from uh, generation after generation after generation, this would be a good place to put in early childhood intervention, uh, career counseling, drug counseling, something to address the problem. And then another more story before I get into the, the, the health side of this uh, talk, but for years radar operators around airports have been trying to filter out all the noise from birds and bees and bats and insects. And a group of anthropologists found out recently, wait, wait, you have data from my 15 years of migration patterns of bats and you've been throwing it away? And I love this, it's like to what, what from one person is complete noise, we're trying to filter it out to somebody else is a complete gold mine. And this is, uh, this is delightful. This is pizza delivery in New York City on a Friday night. This is, uh, <laughs> They put uh, little GPS uh, uh, devices on bicycles. So Nigel Holmes is one of the world's leading infographic designers, uh, was kind enough to actually design six uh, graphics for us for this book, again, showing how Google, for example, uses data. Um, again, I'm going to go really quickly through these slides. How the world of advertising is changing, how now instead of uh, firing a shotgun up at the sky, advertising can now actually target people and provide ads to the people who are actually interested in those specific products. The world of Twitter and how Twitter is really changing the way that, all, that people really have a, a broadcast network in their pockets now and can share what they're thinking in really interesting ways. And that some of the insights, you know, the, the Twitterverse, uh, there's this uh, Twindex recently about actually it turns out to be as accurate as the Gallup poll. So I thought this is a great quote just to end this part of the, of the talk that Marshall McLuhan years ago kind of predicted that we were going to be extending our nervous system out around the planet. So let me tell you um, some of the specific stories about medicine. Um, Thomas mentioned in his opening talk, 23 and Me. So um, on the right is Yasmin Delawari, who's two months pregnant. Uh, her dad is from Afghanistan. Her mother is from Italy. She's always been very interested in her own uh, parentage. And so uh, she very kindly allowed us to, she did a 23 and Me. Uh, test and so she's actually able to find out now what she's passing on potentially to her daughter who's going to be born next month. Muhammad Ali has Parkinson's and uh, also working together with 23andMe. Um, they've invited 10,000 people around the world with Parkinson's to also do a 23andMe test. They're trying to figure out if there's an expression of the gene that can be turned on or off by looking at all these, this is very wide sampling of people with Parkinson's. This gentleman discovered that 1% of the patients in New Jersey were responsible for 33% of the annual health care costs. That the same people were showing up in the emergency room 50 times a year, having all the same body of tests being done over and over again. So they actually put a program in place to make house calls on these people, and it had a, a dramatic effect, simply just showing up at their houses and actually uh, addressing the problem instead of waiting until they came into the emergency room. Um, uh, it, this woman on the left ran up a $750,000 bill in one year, and she's never been back once since they actually started making house calls. Um, Thomas also referred to the quantified self, and uh, I was very fortunate to attend uh, Gary Wolf and Kevin Kelly's quantified meetup last year in San Francisco and learned a lot about this. My mom is uh, going to be turning 90 in April, and uh, she has fallen five times 
in the last four years. It actually fell last week. If we could go to the next slide. Um, my, mom, my dad died five years ago, and uh, we tried to get my mom to move up and live with us uh, here in New York, and she just refused. She wanted to live in the Keys in the house where she and my dad spent many years together. After the third time she fell, and they didn't find her for a couple of hours, um, I said, Mom, we have to do something. We can't just let this keep happening. So I hired these women to live with her in shifts, which, of course, she hated. So she's got a stranger sleeping on her couch, and uh, you know, they're stealing my garbage bags. Mom, they're not stealing the garbage bags. <laughs> um, at TED Med, I ran into an, a gentleman named Eric Dishman, who is part of a, uh, an organization. Between, it's a joint venture between General Electric and Intel. And one of the things they're working on is called the Magic Carpet. So it's a carpet you install in the home of your loved one. It doesn't say good or bad. It just says, this is how Rick's mom uh, walks when things are OK. And then all of a sudden, in a day where her balance is off, her gait is off, or she hasn't touched the carpet until you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, and I know my mom always has coffee at 8.30 in the morning, the, 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 the system sends me a message. So there's no cameras, no, no, not invading, no invasion of privacy, nobody's sleeping on her couch, nobody's stealing her garbage bags. Um, but the product is not out. It's still in research phase. And then I found out about things like this. This is the Jawbone, uh, the up band. I know that Nike is, is here and uh, Body Media is here. Um, there's all these devices now that, that Kevin and uh, um, Gary are going to talk about later that do kind of the same thing. They create a baseline. So every night now, my son asks me, Dad, did you walk your 10,000 uh, feet, you know, steps today? It, it measures my sleep at night. The idea is that my friend Dean Ornish told me that a lot of doctors believe right now we're spending 18% of our GDP on health care. And if you look at the trend line, they're saying by 2025 it's going to be 40%, which is obviously insane. We all know we're paying more and more every month for our, our insurance. The idea is that three years before one of us is in an ambulance on the way to the hospital, our body's been giving off all kinds of signals and signs and data, but we've not been paying attention to it. So one of the ideas is that if we were wearing devices like this, which are actually kind of fun, my brother and I compare our sleep at night, my kids ask me if I made my goal, the gamification of health, instead of dealing with it when you're already sick, but doing it in the early stages makes this uh, a much, maybe this is a way of, of sort of addressing the healthcare uh, um, situation. This is a very interesting story. Um, the Gates Foundation uh, is dedicated to eradicating uh, polio. And in Nigeria, which has the highest resurgence of polio in the world, uh, they found that there are villages that don't exist on any known maps. As people just keep growing out into the countryside, in order to eradicate polio, you've actually got to get into every single family. So they're using a combination of satellite data to find villages that don't exist on maps, together with um, GPS-enabled cell phones are providing the inoculation workers to triangulate this data and make sure that every single person is, is received uh, a polio uh, inoculation. A little bit faster here. I'm going to jump this through this one, too. Another, this is one of the examples that Marissa gave me when we first started working on the project. Marissa told me that they're actually able to use satellites now to actually locate uh, mosquito eggs uh, on bodies of water around the world. And I thought this was really funny. It's like using a nuclear bomb to kill a mosquito, but it's using a satellite to find mosquito eggs. So I said, well, why is that, why is that interesting? And she said, well, basically, instead of spreading DDT and spraying it over a huge area, polluting the water at a great expense, they can actually figure exactly where the mosquito larvae are uh, on, to, on, the body of, on, the, on the surface of water and only goes to those bodies of water. This is Ushahidi. It's an organization that's actually being able to uh, uh, provide remotely. They're able to look at, at tweets and text messages and then actually give healthcare workers in places like Haiti uh, instant information about where uh, bodies of water, where water's needed, where bridges are out, areas that um, when, when the local infrastructure is falling apart, they're trying to uh, use data to actually give people a, a different view. Going here. This one's actually pretty fascinating, too. Up to 50% of the medicine, uh, uh, pharma, pharma, medicine available in pharmacies in Africa are now uh, counterfeit. It looks exactly like uh, the same bottles of medicine that you and I would buy, but the medicine is actually counterfeit because it's so profitable. So uh, there's an organization called M Pedigree, which is also backed by the Gates Foundation, where they put a unique code on the side of every bottle of medicine. So while you're in the pharmacy, you pay for it, but before you leave the pharmacy, you actually text this little code on the back of the bottle of medicine. It's a one-time use 
code, and it tells you right away if that's actually a legitimate bottle of penicillin or antibiotics, whatever the other medicine is. And it's, it's a sort of a delightful way of actually using the information to uh, save lives. These doctors at MIT discovered that when you have a heart attack and you're in the hospital and the doctor comes up and pushes a little button and he prints out you know, 30 seconds of your EKG and says, yeah, I think you're looking all right. I think you can go home in a day or two. Um, it turns out that they looked at uh, actually uh, 24 hours of the printout. This is actually almost two miles of EKG paper, which they no normally do not print out. And they found that there was a very distinguishable, identifiable pattern. So they could actually predict with pretty uh, good regularity wh who was going to have another heart attack within two years and who wasn't. Hugo Campos has a uh, defibrillator that actually uh, transmits his data in his house directly to um, his doctor, which is pretty interesting. He started keeping track of his exercise, of his diet, um, and he was trying to correlate his behavior throughout the day with when his pacemaker kicked in. And he asked the company that made the, uh, uh, the device for a copy of his data, and they refused to give it to him. And it sort of brings up a larger issue, which is like, who owns our data? Why is it that everybody in the world is sort of trading our data, making money, selling our data, and that we seem to have very little uh, say over who's getting it or who's profiting it from it? It's one of the topics that we actually talk about in the book as well. This is actually Jay Walker's book, and Jay's sitting here in front. Uh, Jay gave one of the most remarkable talks at TED Med two years ago. This is uh, The Bills of Mortality. Uh, Jay tells the story much better than I do, and I'm not going to tell the whole thing here, but basically this was a book that um, in many ways gave birth to the modern insurance uh, industry. To, uh, it was the first time the human race had actually used, I mean, as I'll quote Jay, but he, he talks about the fact this is the first time that we were able to actually watch the course of a disease and use the numbers to actually understand what was going on instead of the numbers, the patterns in the sky or the patterns in our hands, but actually use a pattern of numbers to actually understand what was going to happen with the disease. And this sort of gave birth to the idea of a, a plague curve. If you haven't seen uh, the talk, it's on uh, TED Men. It's a wonderful, wonderful talk. I'm going to show you one more thing, and then I'm going to jump off stage here. But um, see if we can, I don't know if you have sound on this. Our world using your smartphone. You can share and compare. Map your daily footprint. Share what brings you luck. Get a glimpse into the one thing people want to experience during their lifetime. And discover hidden secrets about the world you live in. Curious what your phone can tell you about your life? Compare answers with millions of others globally. Find your data doppelganger, someone just like you, somewhere else in the world. We'll donate $1 per download to Charity Water for the first 50,000 downloads as a way to say thank you for participating in the human face of big data. Charity Water uses 100% of public donations to directly fund clean water projects. Participate in one of the largest collaborative events in history and help measure our world. Check out thehumanfaceofbigdata.com to learn more. So we have an app right now that's running for two months where we allow people to sort of compare and share their lives to each other. One of the things that I just wanted to say as I'm sort of finishing up here is um, um, this project um, was made possible by a company called EMC. They're one of the big players in the, in the cloud space and big data world. We're actually delivering this book to 10,000 key influencers around the world thanks to FedEx on December 5th which is really thrilling. Um, these companies have given us the ability to tell a story. It's not about their products. We're not trying, there's no product placement in the book. It's just a very interesting look at a world that's sort of emerging that I think is going to give us, I, I think that the internet was in, it's just sort of a stage going towards big data. I think big data is going to be giving us um, the ability to address some of the biggest problems that are facing the world right now because we're able to actually measure things and sense them and respond to them in real time. So Thomas, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all. Thank you.